Welcome to the debate on data and power. And we're very happy to be here. There is very many people who will be taking uh, part in the debate. There are two experts. Uh, Dominik Spokowski from the Kościusz Polsce <laughs> Institute, a specialist on cybersecurity. Uh, Iris Seeking, who is the curator of Photo, Photo Month uh, this year. And also all the artists that she will introduce in a second. The debate is called Data and Power. And we were just talking about it over a very quick lunch, that it's a super broad subject and we don't even know, I mean, of course we have ideas of how to, how to tackle the, the issues, but it's a very, very broad topic. And we're going to be talking about the, the unseen and untangible elements of reality. The data can be practically everything, but we're going to be talking about it in the context of technology. And technology is not it's not just things we, we use, like tools we use, but also the means in which we redefine our relationship with the world and also with ourselves. So it's all very complex. And also data, maybe it's not a power itself, but it's a way to obtain information. And information is already power. Um, and maybe, maybe I'm gonna let Dominic introduce himself first. <coughs> and then it is, and then we're going to go with artists. Also, I'm going to tell you that my name <laughs> is Alicia Perkowska, and I have a pleasure of moderating this panel. And I, um, I have been working with mostly openness in the context of technology and culture for a very long time now, and I now work with an uh, innovative media project called Outriders and also the Staten Museum for Kunst in Copenhagen, Denmark, where it is. So, I'm going to give you the mic for me, and I'm going to take another one from there. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Dominik. Uh, I'm from the Kościuszko Institute. <clears throat> uh, maybe expert is a little bit too big a word. <laughs> uh, we, I work with mainly in cybersecurity. Uh, at the Kościuszko Institute we deal with the cybersecurity from the public policy standpoint. We are the organizer of one of the biggest uh, uh, cybersecurity conferences in Europe, <coughs> which take place every fall here in Krakow. So let's say that I have a front row seat to, uh, to, to, to watch this whole cybersecurity, let's say, debate unfold, and, uh, and I can talk with experts, so, so maybe I, can, I, can, I will be able to give a little background uh, upon that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I will just uh, introduce the uh, artist shortly, uh, so that at least we, you know, uh, the name of the faces over here. Thank you for being here. It's a lot of people, but I still think it's important that people get to know each other. And later on, of course, you are also present in your exhibition, so then there's also time for more questions and more informal meetings. Uh, next to me is Cameron Lambert. Uh, his uh, project is Collateral Vision that is presented at the Spock Gallery. Then we have Salvatore Vitale. He just had a, a guided tour at the Mozart with the project Illusive Noise. Then we have Esther Hofer. She's upstairs here in the bank here. Her project is False Positives. Then we have Mark Curran. And he is in the Shara Gallery, if I pronounce that correctly. And it's a long term project, The Market. And then we have Rune Peterson. Uh, he's also upstairs here in the bank here with the project The Operator and Target. Target and at the final end of the table, the long table, <laughs> uh, we have Elina Benjaminson, and she's also um, in the Sarah Gallery. So just know who these people are. And I think you take a look at So the structure that we have envisioned for for this discussion is that we have come up with three issues that we're going to go through, and all of them, of course, are in the context of data and power and and the entire festival. Um, and we're going to be giving you a little bit of background information on the, the, the technological background. And then we're going to be talking about specific works of the artists. And we also hope that in the end, when we open up for questions, you're going to ask questions as well as we will. And uh, the first stream, or the first flow, that we were thinking about was the fact that one of the problems we have when it comes to technology is, um, and also data and power, it also reflects uh, where are we situated within um, 
data and power is that the, the lack of common language or maybe language at all when it comes to technology and it was uh, it was very visible recently during the hearing of Mark Zuckerberg in the, in the Congress uh, the way they were addressing similar topics was very different and I think this is a an issue we all face also with the GDPR uh, that came in force yesterday and all of the emails you got and we all <coughs> treated as something annoying when actually this legislation is very important for all of us but we now even we were given some language to understand it, but we still don't fully <coughs> maybe engage with it so I will I will let Dominic shine a little bit of light on it um, <coughs> yes uh, Alicia mentioned here uh, the, the Mark Zuckerberg hearings and for the, in, the, in the American Senate and for those uh, of you who didn't even see the, uh, the even a couple of minutes of it, it's really worth watching and it really gives the perspective of um, where, how, what is the lag between the technologies and where they are already advanced and the public dialogue on controlling and keeping a tap on those technologies because <coughs> that divide is really, is really enormous and even in the, during this uh, <coughs> during this photo month it's, you can see a couple of you can see this recurring theme uh, that we need to, to start developing common language and, and the ways to uh, to describe or, or visualize the things that there, other than especially this, given the data and some data is very like intangible so so trying to visualize those and create some kind of space where the dialogue can happen on this is, is really meaningful because once you, and again going back to this Mark Zuckerberg hearing, I think it's, it's, very, uh, it's very telling about this, this topic that uh, it's, it's really something that uh, he, he was talking about one thing and that the questions were completely off the mark often and, uh, and it was complete chaos and you could see during the hearings themselves how the the stock market value of the of the Facebook itself how it plunged upon the initial release of the of the whistleblower's uh, account, how how the stock uh, value of the company rose as the hearings progressed. So you can see like where like, like first hand like how how is how big is the divide between the understanding and the public dialogue. Yeah. And we wanted also to, in the context of that, we wanted to talk to, to Salvatore and to Mark uh, about their work. So it would be perfect, which I know is very challenging, and <laughs> to, if you could just quickly describe your work first, and then we're going to dive into questions, just because probably not everyone has seen the works yet. I'm sorry for that. No, it's um, right. I can try. <laughs> So uh, the work I'm presenting here, Cargo Photo Month, it deals with exactly with uh, this topic, and uh, it's the part of uh, my bigger project on your country that deals with cybersecurity, and uh, we're trying to find a sort of uh, through photography and other media trying to visualize data. So how you visualize uh, something that is abstract and elusive and invisible as uh, cybersecurity issues. And also how the industry, the, 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 the actors that produce cybersecurity try to give a sort of visualization to this also for very concrete things like selling services or uh, you know, convincing people that they can provide this kind of uh, services. So it's like a binary kind of relationship in this sense. You yes. yes, please. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, well, I've been working uh, on a cycle, which is very brief, a cycle project for almost the last 20 years, looking at uh, small projects in total, looking at the predatory context resulting from migrations of global capital. And this is the most recent, which is titled The Market, rather provocatively, uh, that looks at this, the functioning condition of the global markets and particular relationship to financial capital. Um, which kind of frames other projects uh, to which we're taking uh, in Ireland and on the this journey. So, uh, what drives a lot of what I do is the notion, I to, is the notion of digital media anthropology. So, uh, I agree that data is, is something that we use. So, but one of the key innovators of that technology uh, is financial capital. Um, 
So part of that reason we agree with Salvador is how we visualize those things we can't see or hear. We don't get obvious and pulses. Actually, they're in the room now. We just can't see or hear them. And so how do we and yet they have this sort of uh, role and in defining futures and our futures? Um, so a key element of the project is actually speaking to those who work in this sphere, because I think critically is understanding is the cultural dimension to give cultural description. So there's that, but people describe, they define these systems, construct these systems. So I think it's very important to actually talk with those who construct these systems in terms of understanding the, uh, the thinking, the logic, the culture of that sphere in and of itself to define these. Um, so that's a central point, um, and hence why it's part of insulation or actually transcripts. Um, so yeah, that's a kind of central point. It's very condensed. <laughs> so I have like a simple question that I have actually want to move. Uh, I, have, I have like one question for uh, really two and then maybe you also have something to ask or you can, you can also do that. So I was thinking, Salvatore, like since you were trying, you were struggling to expose things that are unexposed and they're also still not totally exposed because you, you can just access the tip of the iceberg, uh, obviously. Mm. How does the cyberspace look like then? Are you are you <laughs> are you the closer? Wow. Well, uh, no, I don't know. But uh, I mean, uh, of course, it's a lot about uh, as I as I found out while approaching this, and as I understand, it's not just about. I mean, it's very hard to visualize it, and uh, probably, for instance, in our case, the medium of photography is not big enough. So we need to deal with that and then maybe, you know, push the boundaries and try to understand other ways to visualize it. In my specific case, here for instance I did it playing both with photography but also uh, audio and uh, technology itself. So I used technology in order to create an experience that could somehow uh, be used as an example to, uh, to describe a process that happens online. So, you know, it's like a lot uh, of experimenting thing and the society, and then using every element that can help it. So, for instance, plastic signs, like color. Uh, color is something that can really help people to enter and create a sort of mood that helps them to understand. Because something, at the end of the day, technology seems something so far away, but it's also so, so familiar to everyone of us now. And so, there are some access points that we can use in order to foster this sort of uh, debate on how to get there. So that was my way in this case, but also there are many. <laughs> so. Anyone want to go with the question for Mark, or do you want to explore this a little more? Yeah. Okay. No, I just. <coughs> Um, Mark, um, can you maybe elaborate a bit more on um, the work uh, that is made in Zuid As, yeah. which is actually uh, my home ground. <laughs> uh, I live there. Oh, it's a part of uh, Amsterdam, and the time of part of Amsterdam, and uh, we lived there really for 20 years. And we literally saw the banks growing in that area. It's uh, now a, a huge financial district and network, I guess. And uh, I think two years ago you were making this video there, so can you maybe explain a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, if, again, it has to be brief. There's a lot. The project itself at the moment has been almost seven uh, years going because access has been a big issue. Um, so, uh, so there are five locations in the project uh, Dublin, London, Frankfurt, uh, Addis Ababa, uh, and then also in Amsterdam. Each was for a pretty good reason. Um, Amsterdam specifically because it was the site of the oldest exchange in the world. Uh, but my focus really was the role of high frequency trading in her work. Um, and also the shadow banking system. Because um, my native Ireland, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands are central to the shadow banking system. So we're talking about regulation, but the most of the system, even the project I have here, is already out of date. Because I agree, it's already moved into the shadows, which is beyond regulation. It's where most of the money goes around every day. So, um, uh, so this was also one level, and also I, it was part of a commission to which we know of it, and also NEPM, the University of Sunderland. And I got this quite late. And up to this point, to get access to sites and our individuals, it would take a year and a half or two years to actually access uh, 
uh, individuals or locations. So I find that quite late and at this stage, uh, I had visited sort of, uh, as we're immersively, sort of four locations. So uh, I had a sense of the narrative. So but I only had any sort of two months uh, before this work was to be presented. Um, I kind of made a decision where um, uh, I kind of knew at this stage what I was going to be told, the narrative that I would be told. Uh, so with uh, uh, Brett Scott, who's a former financial trader and a sort of activist, he'd written a, an essay uh, entitled uh, Around High Frequency Trading. And I adapted this to make the film that was in, in Zoidash, uh, which talks about the role of, he describes as algorithmic surrealism. Because this is also part of the process. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of people this resonates. So, kind of it so it's a process. So I would argue we've entered actually a point of surrealism in a way. There is no relationship to reality. We need to understand that culturally. Um, so this is also what uh, 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 Brett's essay relates to, which is breaking up you know, energy to create something that doesn't exist. And I'm sure even things like Bitcoin, the energy and expansion. So this is uh, counterproductive. Um, so the film then was in Zoydash, which is a brand new financial district and again centre of high frequency trading and this shadow banking system. So Greece got into trouble because most of the money is going to the Netherlands. Uh, Dyson found the Minister of Finance in front of Greece to get its house in order. And uh, meanwhile, the country's in trouble because of the system he sounded um, So the other element then is to talk about that relationship between financial capital and the state. And so the 3D visualisation you see is where each, each uh, installation uh, generally has been uh, involved the downloading of public speeches made by the Minister of Finance for that country. Um, and then my brother, who's also a coder, wrote an algorithm to identify every time we use the word market or markets in the speeches. And then we turned that data into the soundscape and uh, then with another colleague, Damon, the visualization that you see. So the idea is how do you represent contemporary financial capital? Um, and through the sort of the notion of the relationship with the sort of financialized, uh, commodified nation state itself. So I'm sorry if it's not a bit longer than I'm telling you. So I was, that sort of brings me to the question that I exactly wanted to ask. Because my feeling when I was watching these videos was like, the first thought was about also the invisible hand of the market, capitalism, and then the invisibility of this data flowing. Uh, but also, it, it's more than making me understand what's happening, it made me feel estranged from it. So I was thinking, like, did you want to like explain or did you want to expose it? Uh, well, one, you also want to expose, but in a way, again, that's uh, more substantial, again, because I think it put, getting back to the sort of anthropological dimensions, that it sits in the context of montage, where in the words, the transcripts, the relationship between these things. And uh, like Salvatore said, how you visualize the things we can't see or hear, but it's so uh, uh, relevant to our lives. Right? Uh, um, so it's one too strange that you know because when we talk, there are different temporalities. I don't think there has to be one existing narrative, and this is the possibility to imagine the future. And that's very, very important. Um, because otherwise you get into this uh, uh, uh narratives. So this is the last thing. But I think so. What I think is critical is that we understand these things. And uh, for me, again, it's essentially that we talk to people who work in this, to understand their stories and why people do what they do. Um, and uh, why we construct. Again, the invisible hand, there isn't this one, it's a constructive. You know, remember, they construct the crisis and they also construct the means for the same. That's what quantitative easing does, things like this, uh, to fund the dilatation of these financial capitalists. So because also the, the discussion is about data and power and yeah. power can be economic and can be political and we're going to move to the political a little later because what Salvador was talking about kind of can bring me to the third flow instead of the second one first which was about can art let us understand things that we otherwise cannot explain better can art bring us closer to technology and I would also like to Mm, to pose this question in the context of, of different mediums that are used by all of you at this festival and how, maybe first, uh, maybe first, Iris, like, how were you curating this? <laughs> because there is a variety of mediums, not just... Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a variety of medium. Uh, yeah, because I think we need that. Uh, of course, this is a photography festival from uh, it's traditional, um, but I think in the whole of photography, there's a kind of movement to uh, at least to moving images. It's very close to that, of course, as always is. Um, but it's also um, easier to access, and even like software, it's easier to access. And I'm sure tomorrow we'll talk about it a bit. But also images that are <coughs> around uh, on the internet, for example, as Rune uh, made use of. I will hear later about it. Um, so, <coughs> I mean, yeah, still image can do a lot, but it's interesting to add these other media or tools um, because. In, in that sense, photography, they always say, you know, it's about uh, one image can um, say more than 1,000 words. Well, I don't agree. I think even someone said it yesterday. <laughs> I, I wasn't the one. Um, but I think there are more uh, more possibilities. And, and that's why I also look for artists, uh, as I do in, in also in other exhibitions, and, and especially for this festival, that um, that. If, most of them, I think there are some exceptions, have a uh, background in photography, but also felt the, the borders there. So what I wanted to do, what I wanted to explain or expose or talk about, discuss, visualize, um, I need other tools for that. And so that wasn't, I mean, it's not like I was only looking for video art, but it goes like, um, yeah, just went like that. And, uh, but I still think that everyone except Rune maybe is trained as a photographer here. Yeah, Rune is trained as a painter. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, yeah, Mark, you were trained as a photographer as well. Yeah, so, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, people uh, take different paths to, uh, to go where they want to. And I'm uh, happy to make it possible uh, here. So maybe because, like, uh, in, in Rune, your video is. Uh, about similar topic that Mark talked about, so maybe I would ask you to quickly introduce your work and then I will also like to talk to about footage he used in this installation. Yeah. Uh, so my project is about high frequency trading, uh, which Mark already mentioned. Um, it's uh, basically algorithmic trading on the stock exchange that uh, takes place faster than, uh, or almost at the speed of light. Uh, and uh, what I was interested in was how this kind of, what this means in terms of uh, how value is being processed in the world today, uh, but also how we can, uh, how we can see this, these processes of power. Um, and uh, what I did was that I followed uh, a map uh, that maps out uh, the places, the, the physical places of this immaterial market, you could say. Um, so my project basically documents uh, this uh, very mundane landscapes where high finance is actually taking place and some of the uh, biggest profits are being made today. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, maybe even before Rune, I would maybe ask Dominic to, to, to talk a little bit about blockchain and... and, and yeah, and, uh, and that's central to the whole topic of the financial markets, and I think that that's something we've been observing uh, recently, is the, the Bitcoin fever, basically, that's, that's everybody's now familiar with that. But underneath the Bitcoin is less familiar with the, the underlying blockchain technology, and that's something that it's uh, that it's basically uh, I, I view it as a very revolutionary technology in that it's it's not really building uh, a top of the maybe another word the foundational technology, and that's uh, that's something that really uh, will have repercussions throughout decades and probably like one, two or three decades that this technology will be, uh, will be uh, developing to show its true potential. It's similar in, in many ways to, to, the, to the internet itself mm -hmm. and that the true revolutionary thing is, and I think it's, it's really easy to grasp like, instinctually, is that it's remo it, it removes the need for the third party to execute transactions. So there can then basically banks become obsolete. And that may be an overstatement, and we will see in the, in the future how it will play out. 
but it may happen that banks will become obsolete and that there will already blockchain. Yeah, you, you can make a transaction that's uh, between two strangers that's just involves two of them and no need for any third party. So, so that's, that's really an innovation in the, in the civilizational scale. So I think, and it will, it can com completely transform the, the way we conduct finance in the new world. So, so, so I'm really excited about that and, and I think it's, it, it, it will really redefine really the, the whole economy of the, of the world. Or not, or maybe I'm wrong. But. But it's, it, it has this potential, and I, and I can, and I can, I think I can see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But then again, we need artists to visualize it. <laughs> oh, it's becoming harder and harder. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to move to now is that these things are very abstract, and I don't know maybe trading started with money, which was already an abstract concept, and before it was like money it was something that was treated as money, but it became very, very abstract. And these things are so abstract that we, uh, we tend to be scared, and I think that uh, post-apocalyptic uh, trends are very in now, and uh, it's even like it's very visible in pop culture and all the series that are very popular. Like, we're scared of technology, and I think that being scared of technology it depends what motivates you, but it's not very productive now. What we need is actually not only try to understand but also encourage people to take responsibility because the like, economy can be regulated, many political things can be regulated too, and so can and should be AI, especially as it develops. And this, this is when I would like to ask Runa to actually talk about the, the drones and the war. Okay, um, thank you. I'm trying to make it brief as, as with all these projects, there's obviously a lot of thoughts gone into it, and depending on which tangent you sort of run off on, the story can sometimes differ a bit. Um, the operators and the targets uh, is basically a project that concerns the relationship between the operators of drone, uh, uh, military drone, drones, and the, their targets and then specifically how these two influence each other on perhaps a more psychological level um, via the, the physical manifestation of the drone, which one of them, the targets, can barely see. Um, the operators actually don't see the drones themselves, but they see through the drones. Um, and still, somehow, they, 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 they manage to influence each other. Um, this creates a, a lot of interesting, a lot of terrible <coughs> or horrific uh, things, but it also um, creates a lot of um, visual, of grey visual images which, which uh, we, find, we can find online, which are easily available, and which is also, I think, uh, has become part of, uh, of, uh, of a, um, yeah, part of a dehumanization of, of the other, as it were. Um, it represents a, um, a, a legalistic or judicial grey area, a humane grey area, and uh, a lot of gray areas, basically. It's just like very gray. <laughs> and and yeah. do you think that, like obviously it does, but how? How does it change the situation? How does it change the dynamics between an execution and a victim? It's gray. Um, it's more gray. Well, there's, there's, um, there's a quote, I'll try and see if I can remember it. Um, I can't remember the author's name, but a Frenchman who wrote a fantastic book on drone warfare. Um, he said, um, a soldier is, is, is sort of allowed to be a soldier within the, the, the confines of the war, um, because he's both an executioner and a victim. But the drone pilots can never be victims of the same, so well, what do they become then? That's the question. They become executioners, obviously, but they don't always know who they're executing. Um, and apparently, this uh, leads to um, to 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 um, them also being uh, more prone to post-traumatic stress disorder, the drone operators, than the normal fighter pilots. Now, in no way do I want to excuse their actions, um, but I think it is interesting that that this that there is this sort of feedback. Um, from them watching small pixelated white people, as I call them, 
in the movie um, on screen and, and really sometimes following them for weeks. It's like you know, watching a soap series probably or playing with, with a dollhouse as a kid. <coughs> so somehow they do become attached to them and then all of a sudden they get from above uh, the order to, um, to engage and then you see well, a white explosion on the screen. Um, and, and this, obviously, and then they go home at night and play with their kids, etc. Um, so this, this, this sort of, uh, at the same time, the, 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 the distance to, to the human suffering that they cause, and at the same time, the very sort of closeness to it, uh, apparently, uh, is, is very, very difficult to, to manage uh, psychologically, which I can completely understand. Um, interesting, I think, also is the way then the, the U.S. military deals with this, uh, trying to say yes, uh, and then we'll sort of come back to the, the role of the execution of the victim. Yes, they are um, they are actually exposed to some sort of violence, <coughs> making it making them real soldiers in a sense, and, and saying, okay, it's, it is a, a, a scene of battle because otherwise, one can certainly argue whether the the rules of war uh, do apply. Context. Yeah, I just wanted to mention about your work uh, to add and also uh, about a question you had earlier about uh, photography can do. Um, it's uh, obviously images that uh, Rune uses. It's still images, but it's most of the part is moving images that you um, uh, took from the internet and you find there that are available there. Um, and what you did as a as a layer uh, put over it is you know, made a narration of actually you wrote a story about an operator so make it uh, a person and also on the other side make the target a person so then then uh, you brought back the human factor so to say and um, and I think you it's yourself eh, who's uh, doing the voiceover. And it really takes you in there. So it is with existing images, but then put on a new layer, like like you write a novel, a short, short novel. And that is what engages us, or at least me as a viewer. I was almost crying when I saw it for the first time, because it really makes, uh, makes uh, yeah, you put them in a very close relationship that's not there here, perfectly speaking. So that's what I wanted to add about the way you make your work, the constructed work. I'm going to speak in a second. There's just a third floor. Unless, okay. Um, I wanted to ask something <coughs> about what you say at the, at the incident yeah. of this question. I mean, it's uh, the fear of technology is something also quite romantic, I fear. And it comes a lot from uh, Hollywood pop culture. But also, for instance, talking about this project, if we see the other part yeah. of it, like I've been collaborating with uh, the Vision for robotics labs in Zurich, and uh, they actually do the opposite. So they are developing technology for drones, collaborative drones, that will be in charge to uh, be used for sick and rescue missions, for instance, into nuclear power plants or uh, you know uh, when a disaster comes. So you know, and in this case, for instance, the relationship between the operator and the drone and uh, the target is completely different. It's positive, or it happens that there is not an operator anymore because they're developing a system where drones can auto map the territory and so they are like not, uh, there is no human interaction anymore driving them. So that's, uh, it's very interesting when we speak about technology to look at both sides of the. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. I wanted to mention the thing that there is uh, a big effort going on in the world to ban the development of AI weapons. And I think it's it's, it's, it's a watershed moment because, and I've seen there are uh, military vehicles that are uh, AI powered, but they are not, they, they don't operate the, uh, let's say, the guns actually. So, so there are, so the, basically what the company, the, the defense companies are saying that they are able to make like, uh, 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 warfare, applicable warfare robots basically that are completely autonomous and it's basically just a decision to equip it with a gun. So uh, I, I think it's it's very important to not cross the threshold, and uh, and, and there are like a, a big a international work going on to to prevent that. Yeah. Well, I, I agree completely. It would be uh, uh, one of one of the things. I mean, I'm I'm not against technology in any way. No, <laughs> 
perhaps it's a bit of sidetrack, but, but it, it, one of the things that I was working on while I was um, um, working on this project, uh, what you see up there is, among others, a, a series of small prints, which are basically people just before they get killed. And, and the, these very small pixelated, I blew them up a bit, but those aren't the actual pixels. Um, or at least, at least as I received them on, via the online. Um, and then at a certain point, uh, some of them are uh, somewhat more uh, detailed than others. The resolution is slightly higher. So at a certain point, I started thinking, okay, well, if, if, what if the resolution is really high, you know, and, and they actually know who this is and so forth. But to me, I, I somehow it doesn't really change the dynamics of the, of the situation. It has no... So, yes, I, I can only agree, you know, if you put a, a, a gun in the hands of a robot, you basically get high-frequency killing or something like that. Um, and so in, in the name of efficiency, I guess. And, uh, can I ask one quick thing? Can I? Sure. Uh, there was, uh, I think, no, I completely agree. I think it's, it's been mindful also, I think, because a key innovator I've been working, obviously in my position, is financial capital. So one of the first applications of in, uh, 87 down the street from Wall Street and New York Stock Exchange was a guy called Peter Fly, who innovated a few of your tablets. He innovated this, and this comes so he'd run this room to walk into the exchange, the actual original idea of the tablet. Um, it wasn't Steve Jobs, it was a guy called Peter Fly who worked, wanted to work in New York, New York Stock Exchange and wanted to ensure he got the results that he wanted. And how he did that was he, uh, he stole the feed of the New York Stock Exchange and applied these algorithmic technology. So, one of the first key applications of algorithmic technology, culturally, was through theft in the name of profit. And then 2012, and, and one of the things is that is in 1945, the average US stock was held for six years. In 2000, it was six months. In 2008, it was 24 seconds. And in 2011, I think we're at 14 seconds. So if we think in terms of the, thing, the logic of the system, it's about increasingly the compression of time and space. And now, 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 now. So we can think of any sort of long-term, mid-term, but again, this is one temporality, it's a temporalist. So it's kind of how, because the potential, I completely agree, for positive for some of the application of the sort of circumstances can be very positive it's in terms of how that's used. So in 2012, there's a thing called the Foresight Group, which is part of the British Government Office of Science, and they should be reported to actually the futures of Ireland and trade. And they've already forecast that in 10 years, uh, there will be pretty much no human traders in this sphere. Um, and so, you know, you want to look at the future of capital, you look at trading floors. Uh, it's about abstraction, this is one key function. Uh, and so within that, they talk about too, because again, AI is algorithmic intelligence. There's a lot of these this word artificial, but I think we need to hold on to the word in technology, because words have meaning. Um, um, and you can get distracted by that word artificial. Um, and they talk about then the role of, you know, that, and, the, uh, and this is made up of, I should be clear, of academics, people who work in the sphere, uh, who are then advising the British government on possibilities of the future. Um, and they came up with the notion of the normalization of deviance, in which true the application is because what you're looking at are genetic algorithms. So not just that algorithms are built by coders, but actually then algorithms that build themselves built on their own previous experience. And so in the context where there's very little sort of regulation and oversight, uh, I would argue it's quite limited, and then those who do regulate it, what their background and function is and perspective on those processes and whose interests they have in mind, this becomes very important again, getting back to that cultural description. So they came up with this notion of the normalization of deeds that what can happen is that increasingly circumstances are increasingly normalized and normalized and normalized until it becomes irreversible and potentially catastrophic. And this is what they define as the normalization of events. So it's kind of measuring those, the possibilities between the, what the positive, which are hugely beneficial in terms of fast uh, possibilities, but then thinking of any sort of the culture which generates thinking behind the logic of these systems is very important. Mm -hmm. this, this culture and thinking definitely needs to be challenged and it should not be considered something transparent or natural that just happens. Uh, I just wanted to say that, that like the pixelized uh, victim's image that's very, that's very Black Mirror. I don't really like the series that much, but uh, there was a Muslim episode in Black Mirror, that sort of. Uh, whether once you see the victim being a human, how would it change your reactions? Mm. 
But yeah, technology is like an accelerator or enabler, and uh, this entire abstract image of it makes us forget that it is essentially a tool, and when it comes to the power dynamic, it usually gives more power to the people who already have more power. So, exactly, who does it empower, who does it not empower, and who maybe watches, and who is being watched, and who will pay with their data, and that brings us to the third flow, and I would like maybe Dominic to, to say something about surveillance. <coughs> yeah, that, that is something that just occurred to me during the discussion, but it's nice that there is like counter themes and the first part of the discussion was like mm. how we really can picture the technology and we mm. struggle to talk about it. And, the, and on the other hand, we have technology that is more and more uh, capable of seeing us. And that's the, the discussion about the face recognition and uh, uh, and, and surveillance technology, and I think that, uh, and exactly, and it's like you can see this shift, like uh, like we are less and less able to see into the technology, and how technology is more and more able to see into us, and to uh, and to draw more and more, uh, let's say, advanced conclusions on that. I don't know if you're familiar. There is a actually a Polish uh, scientist, Michał Kosiński, who is affiliated at Stanford. He's uh, uh, his, his main work is, is social profiling. Uh, uh, he missed the Cambridge Analytica scandal by a threat, so he, he was just yeah he, he was just mentioned in one of those, but like yeah he, he was almost involved, but then again not uh, in the last moment. So so he's, he he was able to prove that by uh, training and an algorithm to. Uh, to go through photos, you can determine things like uh, like sexual orientations or or political belief just by, by looking at the photo. Uh, yeah, so so that that's how much an algorithm can see into an individual picture by the looking at the, by the mm -hmm. on a photo. So 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 yeah, that's the extreme in this proportion. And on the other hand, there are like the, the, the AI algorithms that are being developed are more and more obscure. So it's basically it's not able to track the um, the um, uh, the pathway that the algorithm is, algorithm is decision making pathway, so to say. So, so it's, we can determine how the what was the logic behind the decision of an algorithm. So it's it's completely non-transparent. So, so when we see it, when we talk about data and power here, it's uh, it's true what you say that um, there is this more power to the people that already have power, but there is also like more more power to the basically non-human algorithms and, and so kind of like making them this, this, this oracle that we just need to put up with or, or otherwise like what, what, what are the ways of, 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 of scrutinizing or keeping it up on this. And this bring us, brings us back to the, to the question of surveillance and, uh, and face recognition which is extremely important and the more, the more automated these technologies are there, I think the, 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 more, the, the more dangerous and we are on the brink of of massive deployment of autonomous vehicles, and we don't think about it that way when we think about it about when we think about autonomous vehicles. But uh, self-driving cars are with a lot of cameras that are filming everything around the car. So when we have a widespread um, adoption of the, the autonomous vehicles, it's basically that the, the whole city has become like really a, a surveillance like every inch of the city will be surveilled. Mm -hmm. And today, like even when you, I read reports where the, the, the autom automotive sector uh, industry executives speak about the future of the industry, they explicitly state that the, there will be more income for the industry from sal sales of the data generated by the autonomous vehicles than by the mm -hmm. mechanical device itself. S so, yeah, that's, that's something that's like 10, 10 years ago, maybe 15, mm -hmm. depending on maybe on the region. So, uh, so I think that's that's really something that we need to think about now because yeah, exactly when it goes, yeah, when it goes like normalized, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what you can do about it then. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. I don't know if you want to add something. Uh, Esther, could you maybe talk a little bit about the work and then I will ask for more. Yeah, uh, I made a work which is called False Positives and it's uh, it's about surveillance but not about facial recognition. It's more, uh, I was focusing on public space and uh, movement 
and body language, because there are some cameras that can that try to detect deviant behavior and sort of to indicate criminal action before it happens. Um, and I, I went about making something about this through uh, photographing like cityscapes and, and movement within that. So, uh, and also, yeah, I think it actually it's a different way to look at technology and power, but it does have a lot of relationship to what all your projects is about, obviously. Uh, and I liked also, for me, making this project was not per se to, to explain these cameras and how they try to detect deviance, but more to question it. And also in terms of um, uh, questioning it, I like also to maybe use, I think confusion can be very productive as well. So I, I like also to make it maybe even more abstract or but therefore also a little bit more poetic and way to yeah, to think about technology also in a more poetic way to for me it's easier to relate to it in that way. <laughs> and this is a little bit what I wanted to ask you about, like how so how do you see a situation when you see it through the lens of a CCTV camera? How is it different? Well, it also works with algorithm and then, but I think, uh, yeah, what is interesting about what we just spoke about uh, asking uh, or being afraid of technology, I think I'm more afraid of, of like, technology is always sort of an extension of people and um, we choose the way that we want to like what data do we feed this algorithm and how is that influencing the way that these cameras are watching us? Which is a more important question, I think, than, yeah, of course, like if you, that's what it mainly builds off and then it maybe goes its own way, but, uh, yeah, what do you see when you, yeah, I'm not sure I answered the question. It's okay. <laughs> So the work I'm presenting here is called Collateral Vision. Uh, it's an ongoing work since the, the past two, three years. And mainly it deals with the, the representation of human inside algorithmic and machine vision, computer vision. Um, it's not just uh, a single series of photographs, it's more a body of work. So I've, I've got a series which is on facial recognition, as you, as you tell, uh, on the first algorithm which was ever made, which is called Eigen, Eigenface. It's only 26 years old, so it's really a short story. And that's what I, why I started this project, is that there is this algorithm which was created in 1991, and I was like, okay, it's as old as myself. So it's really young and it's really <laughs> shaping our life now. It's there everywhere. And then you have, uh, you have uh, two stage portraits inside an airport body scanner, which has a kind of an Adam and Eve. And here is one of the important parts in, in my work is trying to divert the technologies. It's not just use a tool that exists and that is used by government or by corporation, but it's to try to to make something different with uh, with this with this machine with this computer because I think that's the point of art in the end is trying to make you think different from what's already there and what's already used and in Spark Gallery there is a, a last series which is called uh, Happiness is the only true emotion which is more into what's facial recognition now because now it's not just only recognizing face it's only also recognizing all the emotion. But it's not working that well because here I used uh, an algorithm made by Microsoft, which everybody can use. It's really cheap. It's online, and it, it works really well only with happiness. All the other emotion, the, the, the algorithm is like, yeah, maybe it's that, but I'm not sure, or you know, it, it completely failed. Mm. So that's it mainly. 
how, how differently the machines see us compared to how we see each other? It's a very broad question, but like, what uh, would you do? I think there is, there, it's something really like basic with, with technology is that when you need to, to do a model with like a machine learning algorithm or with any algorithm, you need to, to abstract the subject. So it's the, the basic idea that we can put human and put numbers and numbers going to be human. And that's how like facial recognition algorithm works, is that it takes some point on your face and say, okay, there is this distance, there is this distance, so it's him. And there is something really like kind of do we do we really want a technology that I don't know, we are really complex as a human being, so if we are just an abstract mathematical symbol, is it still a human inside the machine? And then what's, what's the ideal, um, ideology behind this mathematical abstraction? And personally, I'm quite against it because I think it's an oversimplification of, of human life. Thank you. And so now I would like to open open the entire discussion up and so if you have any questions great uh, i will be giving you the microphone and also but also you can have questions and comments so because i'm aware of what's first i did see no, no, you grabbing the mic no, 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 no. yes okay so i'm going to give you my microphone and i'm just going to be moving around <coughs> Um, yeah, thank you, and thanks everybody. I think this is really, really interesting to listen to you, but um, the first time ever I started thinking about as an artist, and you are, also, you are all artists, but you are not also experts in technology. Yeah. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> the, but that's how the discussion runs. So we, we all talk about this technology, and then I'm starting wondering why don't I go to Republika, for example, where there are like other art uh, experts, and uh, do we have to care more about uh, how we talk about our art and uh, the artistic practice? That's one question, and the other question which raised inside me was, it feels a little bit helpless me and myself, like we are now all like we know all these things and we know what to do and we know what's going on. But there, there's this like people who own the technology and they maybe they are thinking, yeah, keep on talking and thinking and trying to analyze what's it for. So that's were the two questions I was thinking during the whole uh, discussion. What, what and why and what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, sorry, it's just new for me too. So. Uh, maybe I, I take on the, the second part of being hopeless in the, in the face of this. And just yesterday, and everybody knows that GDPR came into life and everybody got spammed with tons of emails. But actually, I try to look at it as a really good step in the right direction because what GDPR is. It's basically an answer to the uh, to all of the let's say uh, big and powerful that they are responsible for the data they hold and the data uh, and that your data belongs to you. So so that's maybe oversimplification, but you can you can you can watch it that way and uh, and we'll see how it turns out because that's really something new and that's maybe it's a clumsy way to tackle the problem, but it is a concrete and definite step that was taken and uh, and it's and it won't and it's, yeah it's, it's, its purpose is to bring data back to the people uh, so and yeah man, we'll see we'll see how it will turn out but I think it's it's not only this that we can see the problem and, and do nothing because there are steps being taken and it's just only one of them uh, so so I think it's yeah it's hard but it's it's doable I think and I think also that um, why it might be interesting to watch Mark Zuckerberg at the Congress is that at the beginning there was this feeling that they don't <laughs> talk about the same things, but that then at one of the hearings, one of the older MPs, just because they asked him, they called him in to ask to make him answer <coughs> 26 questions, just yes and no, and he, with every question he had to say, I have to get back to you later, and at the end this man was just like, we called you in here for a public hearing, do you think it's okay that you can answer all the questions? And it made me feel like, you know, he's the owner, but if, 
it goes on, it might seem that we might be able to regulate and also send a message that, you know, like as long as we have nation states, they can serve for something, and at least maybe they can regulate um, those big companies. Pay these taxes. Yes. Hmm? Pay these taxes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, can I? Oh, oh, yeah. I, mean, I don't know if this replies to your question, especially the first, maybe or the third, maybe both. But I think that first, from my experience, working with real experts, because I don't feel myself to be an expert, but of course I'm getting into it, because I collaborate with these people, cost every day, and... But uh, I think that at some point it's very, uh, it's very interesting, this uh, sort of communication that uh, happens between uh, the experts and the audience. And uh, it was very interesting, uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, was this... Uh, Panel talk by Armin Linke and the geologist, and they were talking about this uh, uh, need of uh, you know the audiences because of the internet, especially they are becoming broader, larger, no. So uh, also uh, scientists, for instance, have to speak to a larger amount of people, and before things uh, go wrong, so before then. It be, they reach this uh, polarization, so where there are just a yes or a no, they need uh, to create this sort of simplified language to give people access to certain kind of information. And me, at least personally, what I think I'm trying to do is like being this sort of link between that uh, very technical somehow world and the audience. So probably, it's, I mean, this is one of the roles of art for from the very beginning. So this is something that I struggle with and I try to, to do. I mean, like, sim simplify maybe is not the right time because it can be to, it can have also a negative meaning, but somehow I try to, to translate some uh, hard or difficult uh, uh, concept into something that can be understood to a larger audience, maybe. Yeah, at least we at the start of the discussion uh, on the point of entry of the discussion. And uh, and I think you are, well, the word experts you find it a bit difficult. <laughs> we talked about it in lunch, but uh, for a part you, you are an expert on this uh, topic of technology, to just say it a bit broadly, but, uh, and uh, back tomorrow we have people uh, working on uh, chapters, uh, on the chapter of migration, political migration, so I think it's, it's very important that if you are, as an artist, really want to dig into a certain issue, you should become a bit of an expert, but then still you can always play with that in the end, um, um, if you, how you present the work in the end, and that is of course like in an art form, and in an exhibition space where you, where you invite people, where you help them with the first steps, so to say, in what can be a quite complicated project, because I think that's for all of you. Um, but then, well, and, and, and of course that's the other uh, thing I want to say is um, partly you become an expert but it's, it's, it's also more about collaboration with many people because I think you all did that in all the projects and, and not even only this project but also the other projects in the festival. Um, and that's also what I, uh, what I like about the kind of projects that are on here now. They do research, they need uh, the collaboration with experts, people with a certain background, um, um, or, pe or uh, people that from a totally different profession add something, like for example in Esther Hofer's project there are drawings, they are not made by you. They are. Eh? They are made Oh yes, they are, but yeah, but you have, you make them on the basis of Yeah, the yeah, on the basis. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that is an, uh, going uh, back and forth, and in the end, it's something to uh, experience for the audience in, a, in an art space and, uh, or in an exhibition space in, in, this, uh, in this festival. Uh, yeah, I wanted to respond as well, but I think uh, most things have been said already, but it, it's true that the, the position of the art world is another talk, you could say, what's it going to change, but as has been said, the relationship with, uh, with the audience is very important. As it, bit of an, an, an emancipatory process, perhaps, getting to know about this. I think just adding to, we are, I think more than anything, we are artistic experts mm, yeah. uh, rather than, than sort of technological experts. Then we would have PowerPoints and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I also have <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <but, you know, laughs> <laughs> How is the art market changing or what's the, the role of the art 
Ahmad, but how is our art changing? So how are we changing? Uh, and how is the art we are producing changing? And do we want this? Or do, do I want to be someone who explains something and to be between someone? Or do I want to create something and make something out of my knowledge? And at the moment, there's so much talking about the world. And I don't know why is it? Is it so necessarily? And why can't this understanding be in, within the work? That's more my focus on like how do we change our own artistic practice or work? Discussion. That's why there's so much thought. Yeah. Obviously, I think catch is subjective. Obviously, it does a subjective decision. But obviously, like today we're at a panel and we to talk about that and power. But obviously, in terms of where you position yourself, um, obviously that's a subjective uh, response. Um, and uh, hopefully, if one is doing one's job, it's a notion of open-ended, so people have to come into contact with what is installed or presented, and ultimately. We've all heard this phrase as much about it where complete the meaning, uh, but the notion of open ended. But personally, there's also a gender, it is political, it's about studying power. Uh, the notion from anthropology of Laura Nade and Matthew around uh, studying up. So, this was anthropology instead of studying the colonized, you study the colonizers, instead of studying the powerless, you study the powerful. And ask instead of asking why some people are poor, you ask why other people are so affluent. So I think you know, this is a subjective decision. Um, and it also makes, if I want the word, again, let's get the role of activism. So for personally, the role of access becomes really important as long as it may take in the context of the study of power. But in terms of bringing, ultimately what comes out is open-ended with the notion of uh, maintaining uh, immersively uh, an engagement with uh, to try and understand the systems. Uh, again, this is obviously all subjective. <coughs> One more question from the audience. Thank you. This is a wonderful panel. Thank you for bringing many good points uh, to the table. I was unpuzzled by lots of stuff of what you are proposing. Just um, a bit of a remark in the beginning. If I understand correctly, then if one wants to understand how the world of finance works, understand this is what we work here, they need to talk to the people. And then later on, we hear from Dominique that these uh, algorithms work in a way that actually their designers cannot understand what is the outcome of the algorithm. So in a way, there is a paradox uh, here. And maybe you would like to reflect on the paradox. What is the meaning of the word understanding here in this context? And then later on, I might have not. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's... That's very funny thing about uh, about algorithm because when, <coughs> when like how does um, when you take machine learning yeah, so AI I use AI and machine learning like interchangeably uh, so uh, and it's so, so, so it sort of grows naturally and then when you give it a certain uh, let's let's say endpoint so it, it's free to wander and find the, 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 the best possible way to that endpoint so and it, it oftentimes it's really it's impossible to, to, as I said earlier, to track the decision process that led to the decision. And, uh, and for example, like when Google results or, or Facebook uh, wall pages are are, uh, are produced by by such algorithms, that it's impossible to pinpoint a reason why a certain piece of information was uh, shown on your on your wall or in your search result. So it's they are in that way they are non-transparent. And as the, the let's say as, as the the scope of the of the projects that algorithm tackle are like increasing, so I've seen a comment by one of the Google CEOs some some time ago that that in, in I don't know they, they gave a time frame so that in a couple of years Google wants to answer a question for example if if, you, if it has your profile and in you you're a high school graduate it wants to answer for you what uh, university course should I choose on, 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 your, on your profiling and you won't be able or like you won't be able to uh, maybe, maybe you will I don't know but like, how do you to ask it why because like it's it's so, so it's basically like judging your 
whole personality based on the information you provide and the side economy. So it's sort of becoming this oracle. And it's and in the end I, I don't see like who who is like um, controlling that oracle and, and, and then that's a very complicated question. Because it may work and it, maybe it will choose a, a really good choice for you, but that brings up like I think that's a Pandora box you don't wanna open and I, I don't wanna open so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, just to add, I also feel like as I started out making my project, I went to lots of things, talked to different experts, and I think it's interesting you're not calling yourself an expert because what I found also is that no one really wants to call themselves an expert because it's very easy to think in terms of like people that don't understand anything mm -hmm. about this technology and people that are somehow the creators, but creators only understand the tiny part. And in my topic, I also felt that that was sort of the cause for what I felt was a bit a lack of feeling of responsibility also. Like a lack of feeling of, uh, of really questioning what you're doing because you're only making such a tiny part of the bigger thing. Yeah. Can I add just one? It's just a relationship. In fact, it's a really appropriate question. This is also frustrating because you wonder why even why one does what one does because this can obviously lead up to blind alleys and uh, well, what's the point? You know, uh, why bother? You know? uh, but uh, uh, and I don't know if I've completely got the answer for that. Uh, but I think to not try and encounter with those people is also not an option. Um, and so uh, for me now, where this is going, is it's the talk to coders who make the ethical decisions who actually work within global finance. That's where the next thing is to understand that having talked to bankers and financiers. Um, but I would say, even five years ago, when I would give presentations and I'd use the word algorithm, I would ask audiences like this how many people knew what an algorithm was. And five years ago, even, maybe half the audience wouldn't know what an algorithm was. And if I asked that question now in this room, I imagine pretty much everybody knows what an algorithm is. So the sort of literacy, the vocabulary and understanding <coughs> is definitely increases, and this is very important in understanding these systems. Uh, so I don't know if it answers the question. I just think the option not to, uh, it's not an option. Uh, I really wanted to make one more comment. There's one more question, and we're going to be wrapping up. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's perhaps more of a straight thought. It ties a little bit into what you were saying and some, and some of the remarks that were here. It, it was when uh, Manuel was sort of talking about the, the, the machine seeing. We seem to sort of, uh, we, we, we talk about it. You mentioned the romantics of, of technology, and we talked about this, this seeing entity. And you said earlier on algorithmic intelligence instead of artificial intelligence, which makes it much more mechanized somehow. Um, I would doubt whether I actually know what a look uh, algorithm is, but um, but there's something about we seem to sort of already assume that that someone is seeing us. Uh, I mean, they're, they're are they seeing? Who are they? Uh, it must be a self somehow, um, or or not. I'm, I'm actually I don't know. I'm just there seems to be some some, some well, these semantics there that that, that we've already yeah, uh, sort of tra 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 okay, that's the order. But, uh, but, and you've opened up uh, the, a part of uh, a part of that. But actually, this question is, is really interesting, and then I personally am very like fascinated about the language of describing the technology. And that's maybe it's, it's a different topic, maybe it's not. But uh, when you look at like how the um, at the vocabulary of the, of, for example, the startup scene, it's like angel investors uh, and uh, uh, and like this. Um, uh, so, so it's like, uh, and and what you said, like it's, when we're talking about like, those, those those surveillance technologies, it's like it's it's like this ever watching eye. It's it's like it's it's query like this sort of like semi mystical language enters into the most like most profane of the of the human endeavor. So let's say like this, this technology and what everybody is super secular. And it's, it's it's like it creeps back like uh, through the back door. And it's like, and it's basically it's evoking the same emotions. Like so, it's 
we have ever present observation that judges our every move, and then that's basically that's the realm of religious like experience, and that's and that's super interesting because. Uh, and again, like of, I was mentioning that with Google as an oracle, and that's that's again and again those those like real, semi-religious notions crop up, and it's and it's interesting because like it's so it's something that people are making, but it's not that that, that are deciding. And if you like, if you type into Google like what uh, university should they choose, maybe it's 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 not some individual person, but it's it's, it's very concrete like reality that affects you if you. Yeah, if you, if you follow on that, or even if you don't, it still affects you. I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I just think it's very interesting. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting that I will let you make my little comment myself. But. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you so much for this discussion. It was super inspiring, and I wanted to chime in a little bit with Frank here. Uh, I just totally agree with, 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 uh, with, with, with what you asked, but let's build on, on that a little bit. And propose maybe an analogy, um, because uh, one of the questions that arose earlier is, you know, we are on a photography festival, and you, you guys kind of, you know, go beyond that, that field. But at the same time, I feel that we are totally right here. I mean, that we are on a photography festival. And there's this one uh, figure I would like to uh, invoke here, um, uh, Willem Fusse, yes? Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's, uh, he's very helpful in thinking about these things uh, today. And he was very much of a prophet. I mean, when he wrote um, towards the philosophy of photography in the early 80s, it seemed a little bit over the top, yes? Thinking, I mean, his theory of, of, uh, of, the, of the, the photographic camera as an apparatus and as a toy, yes? As something that is functionally very complicated, but very easy to operate, yes? And we don't know how it works, but we, but we know how to use it, yes? And what are the implications of this toy uh, for us, for our understanding of the world, yes? And that, and and he posts his his whole philosophical endeavor about the relationship between uh, the human and technology in terms of freedom. Yes, that the question is not about understanding how this works, but this is a question of human freedom. Yes, and uh, in his next book, uh, towards the universe of technical images, he, he develops this argument, and he goes in in, in, a, in towards this kind of idea of a net network society that he called telematic society, and basically. What he says connects to everything that you have been talking about. Yes, so it's kind of idea that you start with a, with a very simple thing as a photographic camera as a kind of model or analogy for what we are talking right now. Yes, um, uh, algorithmic um, society, algorithmic you know processes. Yes, um, and so his answer is, is we cannot understand it, but we might be able to play against it. Yes, to make it less. Um, Trans I mean, it seems transparent, yes, but this kind of se uh, this, this semi transparency of what he calls apparatuses, yes, uh, throws us back to, to a mythical thinking about the world. This is something that, that you referenced uh, uh, a minute ago, yes. So, so his idea was okay, <coughs> we can't understand it, we can't uh, totally um, uh, destroy it in a way. I mean, this is a reality that we live in. We might be able to play against it, yes. And I think that the question is. Uh, really, how can we invent ways to play against apparatuses, not to destroy them, but to, to render them less uh, transparent, yes? and to and maybe to, to, to use them to other ends? I mean, this also okay, this, this is also connects to another thing: the dialectics of the uh, of the Enlightenment. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean the same the same technologies that can be that can be destructive for us. Yes, that can be um, very dangerous. Yes, for our okay, for any idea of freedom can be also helpful. Yes. This is something that uh, Salvatore involved in this use of drones for, for example, for rescue missions, etc. Et so this was just kind of your theory. Yeah. Very beautiful remark for the end. But I also think it's not going to be probably because of interest, but if you think about the notion of relation to we have to think about neoliberalism and late capital and the relationship because technology doesn't fall out of the sky. Yeah. It's funded, it's speculative yes. by its nature, and yes. then algorithms are designed to remove any sense of arbitrariness, arbitrariness. This is why even your feeds on Facebook and etc. look like they do, and to achieve the results that they desire. Yeah. Um, and that's where that notion of cultural description is important. I would argue we can understand mm -hmm. um, it may be the implications and consequences, uh, but also in the context of neoliberalism. Yeah. 
I'm very We can understand the uses to which this is the, 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 the... It's a culture, culture that's it. fair. It's, a, it's a, again, the word canon, the vote, ideology. Yeah. That it frames this sort of thing. There's a notion of tech and finance, but a lot of the bankers from Wall Street are going to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. But also a lot of Silicon Valley was originally built up with those mainframe computers by bankers from, um, including the head of BlackRock. So there's all of these, uh, so this relationship, there's sometimes these binary created, but actually that relationship is far closer. And it, well, it's implicit. Mm -hmm. So I think we can make, uh, what's the word? Uh, Problem with your future. I, I, I'm sorry, the word fails me. Yeah, so I think it's kind of understanding this also. I think uh, uh, that frames it. So even when we look at uh, what's framing that experience, it's in some ways a speculative and looking for a return. So it's kind of then, like, and then how we might change that relationship. I don't know. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. The fact that we are wrapping it up now does not mean that the conversation needs to stop. And also, like, um, I think it was intro to the entire uh, catalog written by the director of the photo month that uh, you're supposed to be left with questions and seek, uh, seek the answers, and we're not supposed to know, and like, maybe we don't have the answers, it's all the process. So, thank you very much for coming. I will also let uh, Elise uh, invite you to all of the speeches. Yes. And um, we are indeed wrapping up this panel. Thank you very much for uh, all for coming here. Uh, I think it's very important that we talk about the topics that are raised by uh, by the work that are presented. So that is the that's why we organized uh, three panels this weekend. And uh, what we also organize is that uh, what we also organize is that the artists are present in their exhibition spaces. So from well, that's now, but maybe some of you have to grab a coffee. And uh, the artists that are uh, in Krakow at the moment uh, show their work at the bank here, here upstairs are present in their exhibition. So I would like to ask Katja Stupet or Sieber. They will be present. Maybe you can just wave so people know who you are. <laughs> And I'm about watch you sitting there, and, and from the people here, people are presenting in the bank here. And then a bit later on, I think it's like uh, 3.30, we have, um, we have artists present in the Shara Gallery, in the Help Me Spa Gallery, and Pausa. And Pausa, and Pausa. So, and that's all very close to uh, where we are here now. Okay, that's what I mean. Yeah, and then I have one final thing because I want to say something about Elina Benjaminson because she is here not only as an artist, as a, uh, yeah, she's here as an artist, uh, as part of the festival, uh, but she will stay around here for a whole week because she's part of a Doving Station that is a residency <coughs> program from the Netherlands and she's here and she is trying to develop her project further. So it's about high frequency trading, but probably you are already on, on other topics, I'm not sure yet. Um, but if there's anything you know about, you can share with her any knowledge or network, um, it might be interesting for her to hear about. That's it. Thank you thank very you. much for coming and thank you for